Welcome to the world of inheritance, from the heart of the Egyptian desert, where the sun rises on the eternal Nile River. A journey through time takes us to an ancient civilization whose name has been immortalized in the pages of history. Let us dive into a journey through time to reveal the secrets of the social life of the pharaohs. In the beginning, the ancient Egyptian civilization arose in the Nile Valley, in northeastern Africa, on the banks of the Nile River. The Nile River was the lifeline for the ancient Egyptians, and from here the Egyptians discovered agriculture and it was a reason for the stability and growth of societies. The Egyptians also divided the year into three seasons, the flood season, the germination season, and the harvest season, and the beginning of the harvest season is Sham el Nesim, and they called it at the time, Sham el Nesim, all of which were linked to the Nile River, explaining an important fact in history, which is that the people of Egypt in ancient Egypt lived on this land for 30,000 years, speaking one language and adopting one religion. They remained connected throughout this history, and the Egyptians lived in separate villages and cities until the unification of Egypt occurred, and from here came the ancient Egyptian state in 3200 BC, and on this date it is the oldest state known to history. Factors that helped the emergence of ancient Egyptian civilization. Nile River The Nile River helped provide water for agriculture, and also provided a means of transportation and trade. Climate The climate in ancient Egypt was warm and dry, which was conducive to growing crops. Soil The soil in ancient Egypt was fertile, which helped grow crops. Natural Resources Ancient Egypt was rich in natural resources such as gold, copper, and turquoise. The first name given to Egypt was Kemet, which means perfection, as the Egyptians saw Egypt as the land of perfection, as it had everything a person needs in an integration between the earth and the sky, and from this name came the name Egypt, which is the land of the flood, and then came the word Major, or guarded land, and from it came the name Egypt, and when the ancient Egyptians called Egypt, they said, beautiful Egypt, and the ancient Egyptians imagined the sky as if it were an Egyptian. Lady protecting and caring for the Egyptian land. The ancient Egyptians used a language among themselves called hieroglyphics, which means sacred inscription, and it is the oldest language in the world. In 1988, he found a tomb containing pottery vessels made of bone and ivory, bearing writing and inscriptions dating back to 3400 BC. Hieroglyphic writing consists of symbols representing things, sounds, or concepts. Symbol types. Pictorial symbols represent real objects such as the sun, moon, animals, and plants. Phonetic symbols represent the sounds of the ancient Egyptian language. Specific symbols represent abstract concepts such as love, justice, and life writing method. Hieroglyphs can be written from right to left, from left to right, from top to bottom, or from bottom to top. Uses of hieroglyphics. Writing religious texts. And historical. And legal. And literary. And daily. The hieroglyphic language was deciphered in 1822 when the Rosetta Stone was discovered. Its importance is an important source of information about the ancient Egyptian civilization. Egyptian education is now discussing adding the hieroglyphic language to be taught to Egyptian students next year. The ancient Egyptians used a variety of tools for writing. The most important writing tools. Reed pens, they were made from the stems of the reed plant. Ink, it was made from several materials, such as soot, coal, or ochre. Papyrus leaves, they were made from the stems of the papyrus plant. Writing boards, they were made of wood or stone. Carving tools, they were used to engrave writing on stone or wood. Drawing tools, they were used to draw pictures on papyrus papers or temple walls. Other tools. Pencil case, to store writing utensils. Sharpener, for sharpening reed pencils. Bucket, to keep ink. A piece of cloth, for cleaning. The hieroglyphic language is still a source of confusion for scholars. The emergence of the belief of the gods among the pharaohs. Worshipping the gods is one of the most important beliefs in ancient Egypt. The idea of gods arose among the ancient Egyptians gradually over many centuries. 
The origins of beliefs go back to nature. Nature played an important role in the emergence of the idea of gods. The ancient Egyptians observed natural phenomena such as the sun, moon, stars, rain, and wind. They could not understand these phenomena, so they explained them as supernatural forces. These supernatural powers were associated with different gods. Daily life, some gods were associated with the daily activities of the ancient Egyptians, such as the god of agriculture, the god of hunting, and the god of handicrafts. Myths helped explain the origin of the universe, life, and death. These myths link the gods to historical and natural events. With the passage of time, some gods with similar characteristics were unified. Before the unification of Egypt at the hands of Menes, Egypt was divided into the northern and southern kingdoms, so each side had a special deity that it believed in. After the unification of the northern and southern kingdoms into one kingdom, it appeared. National gods such as Ammonius Are, Isis, and Osiris, as well as local gods, each city or region had its own gods. Among the characteristics of the gods. Human traits, the gods were depicted with human traits and animal bodies. Supernatural abilities, gods have supernatural powers, such as controlling nature and healing diseases. Responsibilities, each god had a specific role in the universe, such as the sun god, the moon god, and the god of death. For those who want more information about the gods, look at the channel for the video Ancient Egyptian Gods, Tales from Time Immemorial. The ancient Egyptians built temples to honor the gods and make sacrifices to them. The ancient Egyptians performed religious rituals such as prayer, dancing, and offerings to the gods. Holidays, religious holidays were celebrated throughout the year to honor the gods. Examples of deities. Are, sun god. Osiris, god of death and rebirth. Isis, goddess of motherhood and magic. Horus, god of the sky and falcons. Thoth, god of wisdom and writing. Anubis, god of the dead and mummification. Influence of beliefs. Daily life and religious beliefs also played an important role in the daily life of the ancient Egyptians. The gods also appeared in Egyptian arts, such as engravings, statues, and drawings. Religious beliefs helped develop some sciences such as astronomy and astronomy. Religious beliefs helped Egyptians predict phenomena such as eclipses and solar eclipses. Religious beliefs helped the Egyptians determine times, such as sunrise and sunset. Religious beliefs also helped Egyptians determine directions such as north and south, as well as developing the calendar, and measuring time, the study of stars and planets, examples of help. Building the pyramids, the pyramids were built to determine the direction of the north. Division of the year, the year was divided into twelve months. Determining religious holidays based on the positions of the sun, moon, and stars, and gods also appeared in Egyptian arts such as inscriptions, statues, and drawings. Ancient Egyptian society was a complex and hierarchical society headed by the pharaoh and the government notables, followed by the class of priests and nobles, then the class of soldiers and scribes, followed by the class of craftsmen and merchants, and finally at the bottom of the pyramid the classes of peasants and slaves, first the pharaoh. The pharaoh possessed absolute power in ancient Egypt, as that power was granted to them by the gods. The pharaoh was considered the son of the god Are, and therefore they were considered gods, and the link between humans and the gods, as they implemented the desires of the gods by ruling the country, enacting laws, and achieving balance. Justice, protecting the country from any external invasion by having a strong army, achieving the welfare of the subjects, and keeping the gods happy so that the Nile does not overflow or the crops dry up. In addition, the pharaoh was the owner of all the lands of ancient Egypt, but he could gift any land to whomever he wanted. Secondly, the minister is considered the second most powerful position after the pharaoh, and sometimes he held the position of high priest of Ammonius R.A., and he was appointed by the pharaoh, and his term could continue for several rulers unless the current pharaoh wanted to install a new minister, and among his most important tasks were the following, supervising the political administration, and all official documents must contain his seal.
supervising the tax system, monitoring the supply of food, ensuring the safety of the royal family, listen to the problems of the nobles, and arbitrate their disputes, rule the country in the event that the pharaoh is unable, due to illness, injury, young age, or any other reason that prevents the pharaoh from carrying out his duties. Third, soldiers and scribes. The task of soldiers in ancient Egyptian society was to protect the state from external invasion and to nullify any internal revolutions. They also supervised the workers when building the pyramids, and the soldiers obtained wealth from the spoils of war and from the pharaoh's gifts to them. Scribes were among the few who could read and write in ancient Egypt, as their task was to keep records of the number of soldiers in the army, food production records, the number of workers on construction sites, legal contracts, wills, tax records, genealogical records, medical procedures, and magic spells. In addition to writing the Book of the Dead found in pharaonic tombs. Fourth, the craftsmen and merchants. The craftsmen class included doctors, painters, sculptors, carpenters, miners, goldsmiths, potters, sculptors, weavers, and stone carvers, and the merchants sold the craftsmen's products within the state. And abroad, they brought products from abroad, such as elephant tusks, tiger skins, ebony wood, cedar wood, and giraffe tails to be used as fly swatters, in addition to animals for temples or palaces such as lions and baboons. Fifthly, the peasants. The peasant class included farmers, servants, and construction workers, and it was their tasks are limited to cultivating fields, raising livestock, and maintaining canals and water tanks, in addition to working in quarries and building royal monuments. Sixth, slaves slaves were prisoners of war, as the ancient Egyptians did not have a market for slaves, and they were forced to work in the homes of nobles or temples, or with the ruling family, in addition to forcing them to work in construction. Pharaonic marriage had rules and customs, the effects of which are still present among the Egyptian people. The ancient Egyptians knew the bride's guardian, the contract, the dowry, the list, and the buttocks. Marriage in ancient Egypt was carried out on the basis of a written contract, in which the wife's rights, dowry, and pension were written, that is, all the details that are written today. There were rules that must be followed before marriage. In the agreement, the value of the dowry, including silver weights and tangible items, was determined by the groom, and the groom was obligated to support the bride in his presence and in his absence, meaning that she was completely obligated to him, and her family had no role in supporting her after marriage, and the husband agreed the right of his children from her to inherit from him and an appropriate compensation to be paid to her if he separated from her. The dowry was called Sheben Sama, or Hebet al -Bakr, and it was a dowry commensurate with their level and age, whether it was immediate or deferred, and the wife entered the marital home with appropriate movables called Nekton Er Hama, or Nekton Sama represents her luggage or device, the ownership of which she maintains, and which she has the right to recover if her husband divorces her or dies. After agreeing on the terms of marriage, the engagement ring made of gold, which was called the resurrection ring, was presented. The bride wore it on the right hand and was transferred after marriage to the left hand, which is what is followed in Egypt until now. He pointed out that the age of marriage among the ancient Egyptians it started from 15 years for men and 12 years for girls. The ancient Egyptian viewed marriage as a sacred bond witnessed by people and witnessed by God. Marriage must be based on a valid choice so that both parties can care for the other and provide an atmosphere of love so that the family can enjoy happiness and stability. Likewise, ancient Egypt did not adhere to sharp class and ethnic differences in matters of marriage and human relations, but rather the differentiation between families in society was based on legal foundations of differences in cultural levels and material capabilities more than anything else. Evidence of the Pharaoh's sanctification of marriage and family formation is the following. 5,000 years ago, the sage Tahotep advised young men to get married, make a home for themselves, and have children before they grew old and their children were born orphans, as he described them. Tahotep did not limit himself to offering advice, 
but he explained the reasons, which were his desire for the young man to become a friend to his son or daughter when they reach adulthood, and so that the age difference between the father and mother and their children would not be vast, and the gap between them was deep, so that one group of them would not be able to understand the other. The ancient Egyptian had children according to his economic ability and what he could provide for his family. The owners of agricultural lands and large estates would not refrain from having many children, hoping for the abundance and pride that would develop, preserve, and manage the family's wealth. The pharaohs paid attention to the appearance of the children always with the parents, and family portraits spread inside the tombs, as well as a variety of carved statues known as family statues. Caring for the child before he comes into the world begins with taking care of the pregnant woman's health. There are the pharaoh's advice and guidance for the pregnant woman to maintain she is pregnant and gives birth to a healthy child. At the moment of birth, the newborn is examined and its safety is ensured. They reached the point of distinguishing the scream of a newborn at the moment of its birth, and through it they were able to know whether the newborn was normal and would live, or if it was not, and therefore would face the risk of death. Once the newborn came to life, it was provided with a number of amulets that they thought would provide protection. Magical protection for newborns from the evil eye and the eye of envy as well. The most important amulets that were either hung around the newborn's neck or attached to his clothes were the blue eye of Ujat amulet, which protected the newborn from the evil of envy and the evil eye. The amulet of Isis, the amulet of Bess and Tarit, and many other means of magical preservation and protection. The matter did not stop there. Rather, there were magic spells and spells that were cast on children when they were sick or crying for no apparent reason, such as the mother saying, Go away, you visitor of darkness creeping upon your nose and face. We do not know the reason for your coming. Did you come to kiss the child? I forbid you to do so. Did you come to spoil the baby? I'm forbidding you. Did you come to harm him? I'm forbidding you. Have you come to take him away from me? I forbid you to do so. This is very similar to the incantations and incantations that are still used in rural and upper Egypt to this day, where many mothers still burn incense, which is a pharaonic custom, and they cast spells such as, Go away, you evil eye, go away, you evil eye of the jinn. Those who believe that the pharaohs relied on magic to protect and heal children from diseases are wrong. We do not need evidence of the progress of medical science in ancient Egypt, as their doctors succeeded in diagnosing diseases and prescribing the appropriate medicine. They were the most knowledgeable people on earth about the anatomy of the human body and understanding the functions of the organs. The pharaohs had doctors who specialized in ophthalmology, dentistry, cardiology, internal medicine, and orthopedics. In the time of the pharaohs, children received distinguished medical care available to all classes of society. The poor classes resorted to temple doctors registered with them and approved by their teachers. There was a doctor for noble families who was called when needed, and there was also a royal doctor concerned with the health of the king and members of the royal family. The ancient Egyptians were concerned with the cleanliness of the body and the safety and protection of the skin. It is said that bathing the newborn was part of the celebration of his seventh day in life, his passing of the stage of embarrassment and the completion of his senses. Bathing was a favorite custom among the pharaohs, followed by perfuming the body with aromatic oils, some of which provided the soul to the wealthy, including the humble one available in markets for the public. The pharaohs preferred the custom of cutting the hair of children, whether girls or boys, in order to protect their heads from pests and to preserve the cleanliness of their bodies. Children were distinguished by the presence of a single braid of hair on the side of the head, which the mother creatively styled and braided in different shapes so that her child would have the most beautiful appearance. Children enjoyed large areas of freedom in their early years. They had the right to have fun and play with their peers, whether inside palaces or in palace gardens, under the eyes of servants, or in the narrow streets and alleys in villages, and under the eyes of mothers or older children if the mother was busy with housework. Education began at home, and depended first on how the children became accustomed to the way the husband and wife treated each other, then how the parents dealt with those who were older, such as grandparents. For example, 
customs and traditions were passed down from one generation to another. It was bad manners for an old person to stand and a young person to sit, or for a young person to speak in the presence of an old person, or for a young person to extend his hand to food before the old person. The family in ancient Egypt was responsible for raising the child in his early years, socializing him, teaching him how to walk, talk, how to eat, and some other religious and moral principles. The children knew the games, girls had dolls and boys had crocodile-shaped toys. Children remained in their family's nursery until the age of five, when they entered school and learned the principles of writing, arithmetic, and reading. The pharaohs taught their children wisdom, virtue, and obedience by respecting their teachers, obeying their orders, and adhering to what they learn, so that they acquire moral and social values. Punishment was common in raising a child among them if they misbehaved. Parents in ancient Egypt instilled in their children various educational principles. The children of peasants received a minimal formal education limited to how to plant seeds, reap the fruits, and collect the crop, while craftsmen taught their children the principles of their crafts and industry. As for the upper class, it relied on specialized teachers to teach its children. The children of the middle class used to go to the temples to receive their education under the care of a specific teacher, and the curricula included education, reading, writing, memorizing literary texts and stories, rewriting texts, and performing exercises on wooden or stone tablets. The artists and sculptors were educated, as they had to convert the brief texts written on papyrus or pottery fragments into hieroglyphic writing on the walls of tombs and temples and also engrave them on statues, which requires knowledge and knowledge of the two writings. The majority of the bureaucratic class in ancient Egypt was made up of scribes who played prominent roles in government projects, as the position of the scribe in ancient Egyptian society was not limited to the tasks of writing down texts and documents only. He said that as much as there was interest in the child's physical education, there was interest in his spiritual and mental education, as was evident from the advice of the wise Ani, and Ani school can be considered more like a kindergarten, but the truth is that serious study did not always begin at such an early age, as he did. Ani, he learned to read and write from his parents before entering school, and the parents were keen to push their children into education, advising them to become writers and to seek more knowledge and stick to books. The ancient Egyptians knew about adopting children thousands of years ago, and that sterile couples could resort to adoption to compensate for their inability to have children, according to a recent Egyptian study. The study, issued by the Luxor Center for Studies, Dialogue and Development of the Republican People's Party, said that wives and husbands who failed to have children resorted to adoption, which Egyptology books say was very common in the era of the New Kingdom in Pharaonic Egypt, according to the German news agency. The study adds that many of the popular legacies prevalent among Egyptians today are legacies that they passed on from their ancestors, the pharaohs, and that holding women responsible for giving birth to a male heir for the family was a common thing in ancient Egypt, and was a reason for the separation and divorce of spouses, as is common today in circles. Egyptian Popularity The study showed that the ancient Egyptians considered the task of producing a male heir for the father to be a major task for the wife, and failure to achieve it constituted a reason for divorce at that time. According to the study, spouses in ancient Egypt were asked by the family to have children as soon as they married, because they believed that having children was one of the greatest blessings, and that the God smiled at those who supported large families. The study indicates that having between 10 and 15 children is a reason for pride among families, and that King Ramesses II was an object of admiration for his people because he gave birth to 100 males and 50 females. According to the study, the ancients knew what is known today in Egypt as family planning. If a family had many children and could not afford new children, resorting to contraception was the option to stop having more children. According to the study, there were popular contraceptive recipes, such as wives eating plant fibers coated with a mixture of yogurt and honey, natron salt and crocodile dung, and another recipe consisting of cotton dipped in palm bark and acacia, in addition to sour or lactic acid, which it acts as an effective substance to kill sperm. The study showed that the ancient Egyptians also knew what is known today as a pregnancy test to determine the sex of the fetus. 
the study says that the birth process was a very joyful event, and birth rituals were performed, according to the beliefs of the pharaohs, by invoking the gods, as the mother was the focus of attention of the family before and after birth, and amulets were placed around her to guard her. Turit was the guardian and goddess of waiting mothers, and her statue, shaped like the body of a pregnant female hippopotamus, was placed next to pregnant women, while Bess, the god of fun, was used to expel evil spirits during childbirth, while Hecate, the frog goddess, and the goddess of fertility and childbirth. It is prepared to facilitate the birth process. Polygamy was not something known to the ancient Egyptians, unlike some of their kings, but a well-off man had the right to have many female singers and concubines, and the king had the right to take, in addition to his legitimate wife, the queen, other wives who had no right to inherit the throne. Ancient Egyptian society knew polygamy within the royal palace. King Khufu married more than one woman. Also, King Teddy, the founder of the Sixth Dynasty, had two wives, and there is King Amenhotep III, from the 18th Dynasty, who married Babylonian, Mitanni, and Assyria, in addition to his Egyptian wife, T. King Ramesses II married Nefertari and Isianefert from Egypt, then his son Katusil, the Hittite king. Polygamy was permissible among non-kings. From the 6th dynasty there is Prince Merikare, whom he depicted. The inscriptions are surrounded by six wives, and it was common for a man to have one wife. As for polygamy, it is due to its permissibility in the traditions of the people, but economic circumstances determined it, so it became limited to the royal family and the nobility, although this does not prevent it from being said that polygamy was known in the middle classes. And perhaps the poor woman as well, although in most cases the priests married only one woman. From the Ptolemaic era, we find that one of the high priests of Memphis was married to more than one woman. This was not the only case of its kind, but was preceded by several cases in the Egyptian dynastic eras in the same priesthood and in others. The Egyptians are people of civilization, and civilization in its aspects means progress, work for the future, and attention to all members of society, especially women, who represent a major indication of the progress and advancement of society. Ancient Egyptian antiquities and manuscripts attest that Egyptian women received great attention and were granted many rights that no other woman had ever obtained. In that time, the status of the ancient Egyptian woman was evident in the ancient state before monarchy and feudalism. The pharaonic woman worked in factories, spinning, weaving, and making carpets. She traded in the markets and shared her husband's fishing work. The wife was drawn on the cemetery until the third and fourth dynasties. The size of her husband as evidence of equality in honor, status, rights and duties, and in the statue of Bajam, in the Karnak temple, the wife precedes her husband. There is a special memorial to Mrs. Pazisht in the era of the Old Kingdom, which shows that she was a director of doctors, and one of the husbands was tried because he insulted his wife. By flogging one hundred lashes, and by depriving him of his share of the money he earned jointly with her if he returned to Sava. While Dr. Zahi Hawa says in his article published in a Shark al Asat newspaper, the Egyptian woman in the pharaonic era enjoyed many rights and was worthy of appreciation, as equality between men and women was taken into account, so the Egyptian lady of the ancient world achieved what no woman had in the ancient world. Women had some private property and lands, which they supervised their management themselves. This led to them enjoying a kind of financial and economic independence, as they had the right to file lawsuits on their own. They were also represented as witnesses before the judiciary when their testimony was requested, and they were punished if they committed any crime. The Egyptian woman was the first fashion designer in the world. The Egyptian woman used to highlight her feminine beauty and add aesthetic touches to her oriental nature by applying cosmetics and perfumes, all of which were born on the banks of the Nile River since ancient times. She left tangible imprints on Egypt's civilization and transferred them to other civilizations after proving her ability. To interact with its extremely hot environment, it invented means for skin care, body protection, and perfuming. In ancient times, Egypt knew the art of making cosmetics. 
Discoveries and inscriptions on the walls of tombs and temples showed the use of plant extracts, paints, and aromatic oils that restored Egyptian women to the luster and freshness of their skin, as well as recipes for hair softness and protection. Throughout the ages, Egyptian women have been keen to highlight their sensual beauty represented by the beauty of the face and the grace of the body, or more precisely, physical beauty and its various elements, which is what made some scholars divide this interest into three sections, clothing, cosmetics and hair styling, and the use of essential oils for the purposes of perfuming the hair and moisturizing. The body. Likewise, the Egyptian woman maintained her appearance in the most beautiful adornments that gave her body charm and attractiveness, thanks to the use of cosmetics that treated skin color, as well as lining the wide black eyes that distinguished Egyptian women in particular. Many historical sources agreed that women enjoyed a rare degree of beauty thanks to what this was inferred from the inscriptions and methods that she used in the plastic surgery process. Women in the Old Kingdom wore clothes woven around the body through which the charms of the body were highlighted. The woman's dress descended from below the chest until it reached the ankles of the feet, and was carried by two straps over the shoulders, which sometimes dropped down. Along the chest to completely cover the breasts, as appears in the statue of Princess Nefert, wife of the chief priest of the city of An, Ein Shams, Prince Rahatep from the Fourth Dynasty, preserved in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Egyptian women were keen to combine the beauty of the face and innovate methods to highlight the beauty the head and hair. Since the times of the Old Kingdom, she has resorted to the use of wigs, and she has worn artificial hair strands that differed from the nature of the era for the purposes of complementing her adornment, or for the purposes of concealing what old age sometimes caused by some of the strands falling out. Wigs played a major role in the attractiveness of Egyptian women. On the walls of temples, you find signs of love in lines and drawings. At a time when the world celebrates Valentine's Day, the ancient Egyptians were among the first to celebrate it, 4,400 years BC. The ancient Egyptians were the first to know love, passion, loyalty, and fidelity between the relationship between a man and a woman and a husband toward his wife for thousands of years. The ancient Egyptians used roses to express mutual feelings of love between lovers, and this appears through the inscriptions and drawings of the pharaonic temples and tombs. The Egyptians have been sanctifying love since the time of the ancient Egyptians. The Egyptians, ancient and modern, have been keen to exchange gifts represented by flowers and roses as a form of appreciation for each other among loved ones. Some in a way to express their feelings, and the ancient Egyptians celebrated Valentine's Day in the city of Memphis. There is a cemetery in the Saqqara region dating back to 4400 BC, in which an inscription was found that recorded the moment the couple looked into each other's eyes as they exchanged good feelings of love. The ancient Egyptian kings bragged about immortalizing their love stories using the cornerstones of art and architecture, so they wrote immortality for their queens with buildings dedicated to them. Countless inscriptions highlighted their brilliance throughout Egypt. Among the most famous love stories is the love story of King Amos I and his wife Amos Nefertari, King Amenhotep III and his wife Tai, and King Amenhotep IV known as Akhenaten, and his wife, Nefertiti. The pinnacle of love stories was, of course, what brought together King Ramses II and his beautiful wife, Nefertari, in addition to the most famous stories of loyalty, which tells the story of the legend of Isis and Osiris. Many legends also appeared about this sublime human emotion in the time of the pharaohs, as the papyri showed that the woman used to resort to magic and spells until the man fell in love with her. Likewise, men would sometimes beg the gods and threaten them at other times, if the woman was not convinced of their love. The ancient Egyptians believed that in love is a hidden, volatile force that cannot be controlled, so men and women resorted to magic. The ancient Egyptians used to love flowers, as flowers had a great place in the souls of the ancient Egyptians. The ancient Egyptians knew this thousands of years ago, and the lotus flower was the symbol of the country. There is a widespread belief that the kings of ancient Egypt married their sisters and sometimes palace daughters to preserve the royal blood, and while historical studies confirm this, they suggest that some details are incorrect. The fact that some of the pharaohs and those who followed them who ruled ancient Egypt, 
and even ordinary people who lived through those periods, married their sisters, varies, as this practice was not prevalent in all periods of time that Egypt knew. Most Prominent Royal Marriages Marriage within members of the ancient Egyptian royal family was an expression of a practice that reflected religious beliefs. Some pharaohs even married their own daughters. Ramesses II married Meridiman, one of his daughters. The most prominent Egyptian rulers who married their brothers were Sinusrat I, who was married to his sister Neferu, Amenhotep I, who was married to his sister Amos Meridiman, and Cleopatra VII, who was married to her brother, Ptolemy XIV, before his murder. Some scholars, including Zahi Hawass, the former Egyptian minister of antiquities, have suggested that consanguineous marriage contributed to Tutankhamun's medical problems. The religious reasons. Many Egyptian kings entered into royal marriages, brother and sister, to emulate the practice of Osiris and Isis, two Egyptian gods who were siblings married to each other. The ancient Egyptians were the first to care about personal hygiene, and they have been known for this since ancient times. They were the first to transfer the meanings of cleanliness to other civilizations, especially dental care tools such as brushes and braces, as evidenced by the evidence of murals and papyri. Their keen interest in them appeared in the simplest manifestations. They were very careful with their teeth, and they used tree branches to clean them of food residue, which is similar to a toothpick now. He mentioned that the first doctor to specialize in dentistry was Hesi R.A. from the Old Kingdom, and this appeared in a wooden plaque carved from cedar wood imported from Lebanon in which his medical specialty was mentioned. They used toothpaste made from eggshells to preserve the gums and teeth while taking care of oral health. The occasion, they used aromatic vegetable oils, grinding some stones and salts to make the paste. They also began to unify the asymmetrical and overlapping teeth, so they were the first to invent orthodontics, and this appears in most of the ancient pharaonic papyri, with surgical tools that resemble the same modern tools currently used, with the ancient Egyptians relying to fill the cavity caused by caries, on a paste consisting of powdered mineral substances that have a medicinal effect that leads to stopping tooth decay. The ancient Egyptians tried different treatments for the teeth and gums, and one of the most important recipes was the recipe for dharmka, which is a coin-sized amount of salt, tulips, and a spoonful of black pepper, and using the mixture as a toothpaste to clean the teeth, as there were many diseases, which is widespread among the ancient Egyptians, including tooth decay, receding gums, and bleeding. Writings were found that proved that the pharaonic civilization had many cleaning tools, in addition to medical papyri that talked about the importance of cleanliness. He explained that the ancient scenes on the walls of the temples confirmed that they cared about cleanliness of the body, including trimming the nails, cutting the hair, using toiletries, and painting the bodies with perfumes. Some papyrus papers dating back to a thousand years BC talked about the importance of cleanliness and the teachings that they were to avoid bad odors. Why didn't the pharaohs wear winter clothes? The main reason is that the pictures and engravings that show the pharaohs without clothes are symbolic and not realistic. Ancient Egyptian art, it focused on showing the human body perfectly, and artists tended to remove clothes to show the details of the body accurately. Where the royal costume was the most valuable and expensive, and was decorated with colored and embroidered threads, and a linen fabric was revealed, topped with what looked like wool. The pharaoh's clothes varied according to social class and profession. The clothing of the pharaohs changed over time. Some of the pharaoh's clothing still exists today, such as Leather, it was used to make coats and shoes. Linen, it was used to make underwear and shirts. As for the priests, they had a special status. It was forbidden for them to wear some fabrics, such as wool or leather, which were taken from living creatures. They used to wear clothes made of linen, and this was constant throughout the ages, as travelers mentioned. Herodotus, they wore a linen robe, always making sure it was freshly washed. The scarf was worn by some priests, such as the chanting priest, which determined its function and distinguished it. As for the specialized priests and senior priests, they had the right to change this outfit. The named priest wore the skin of a leopard, while the priests of Ein Shams wore the skin of the local leopard with decorations in the form of stars, and this outfit gave them a kind of dignity and prestige.
In summary, the priest's uniform was a long leopard skin robe that the priest wrapped around his body and hung the upper part above the shoulder. It was completely different from the uniform of the nobles around him. Food held importance in the lives of Egyptians as evidenced by one of the functions of the king himself and the belief that it is his words that create food. The Egyptians knew how to grow many vegetables, such as peas, garlic, onions, and lettuce. There are also inscriptions indicating that they knew from early times the cultivation of types of fruits, such as dates, which are a popular fruit for the general population, in addition to figs, grapes, pomegranates, and watermelons. This is what appeared in inscriptions on buildings dating back to the period. The Eras of the New Kingdom, according to the Division of the Eras of Ancient Egyptian History. The ancient Egyptian was keen not to go overboard or crave food in order to preserve health, and he also deliberately showed the graceful figure of both sexes in his inscriptions, artistic sculptures, and literary teachings, as is evident from a text written in the teachings of a person called Kajemni. From the sacred texts and worldly texts of the ancient Egyptian text, if you sit with many people to eat, look at the food indifferently, even if you desire it, self-control does not cost a person more than a moment, and it is a shame for a person to be evil, for a cup of water quenches the crop. The will of another person, known as Kidi bin Dawaf, to his son Bibi, where he says, Be content with your food if three loaves of bread and two mugs of beer are enough for you. If your stomach is not enough, fight it. The scarcity of historical sources does not help in providing a detailed description of the methods of Egyptian cooking his food at home, except that food can be divided into two parts depending on the environment in which they are consumed, the food of this world and the food of the afterlife. The food of the ancient Egyptian in his daily life was not merely to satisfy a state of hunger, but rather he used some of these foods are used to formulate medical prescriptions that help him overcome health problems and diseases, which is evident from the availability of a number of medical papyri that were written specifically for this purpose, the most famous of which is the Ebers papyrus. Named after its discoverer, the German scientist Ebers, in 1862 in the cemeteries of Thebes, which dates back to 1550 BC during the reign of King Amenhotep I, Dynasty 18, it includes hundreds of popular medical recipes, including recipes that used medicinal herbs, aromatic plants, vegetables such as onions, and other plants such as aloe vera. There are also two papyri of great importance in this field, namely the Papyrus Hurst, which dates back to the era of King Amenhotep I, and contains 260 medical prescriptions, and the Berlin Papyrus, which dates back to the era of King Ramesses II, Dynasty 19, and contains 204 medical prescriptions, as well as other papyri such as Edwin Smith and Chester Beatty. The ancient Egyptian used the bounties of his agricultural land, in addition to food, to provide during the celebration of various holidays, which scholars of ancient Egyptian history have divided into official holidays, such as the Flood Day, the beginning of the seasons, and the New Year's Day, and local holidays. These are holidays that are held in specific Egyptian regions, and religious holidays, such as the Great Opet Festival for the procession of the god Ammonius, and agricultural holidays, such as the Feasts of the Fulfillment of the Nile and Sham el Nesim, which has been famous for thousands of years until now for eating food such as eggs and salted fish, and onions, the Feast of Plowing the Land, and the Feast of the Goddess Renat, the goddess of the harvest, in addition to funeral occasions. The Egyptian was interested in the great popular religious holiday of Opet, for example, in which the god Ammonius, the official god of the state according to Egyptian religious beliefs in the eras of the New Kingdom, according to the division of the eras of ancient Egyptian history, moved from his temple in Karnak to the temple of Luxor, and the king was during this popular occasion, sacrifices consisting of meat, birds, fruit, milk, bread, and beer are offered. An attempt to divide the classes of society in ancient Egypt may help shed light on the dietary habits that characterized each class of society. The food of the simple class of the people, such as the peasants, who were the toiling class in the country and the poorest, depended on the presence of bread, beer, and some simple vegetable foods. As for eating animal meat, these peasants preferred the field and the care of those animals, which helped them in their agricultural work, over they enjoyed eating its meat, 
so they resorted to what is known as rationalization of consumption for the benefit of their source of livelihood. As for the middle class, which represents the construction workers and the artisan group, they were somewhat more fortunate compared to the peasants, as their work depended on what is known as the system of distributing daily supplies, in which foods varied between meat and fish in addition to vegetables, and this is indicated by what was revealed by the excavation work. In the tombs of workers building the pyramids, in the Giza region, food remains were found, including fish skeletons that were distributed to workers while performing their work tasks. As for the upper class and the nobility, which is the luxurious class in society, the types of food varied between meat, fish, birds, vegetables, and fruits. Of the finest types, as well as bread, pies, and drinks, especially wine, as evidenced by the inscriptions of the tombs of the state's nobles throughout the ages, the most prominent of which is an inscription in the tomb of the vizier Tahotep. The ancient Egyptian used many tools to cook food, starting with the oven, whether it was fixed or portable, which took the cylindrical shape. In order to light the fire, the ancient Egyptian used wood known as sharky wood, in addition to stoves, ovens, and the necessary wood for fuel. The kitchen included many tools. Cooking utensils with two handles, dishes, bowls, jugs, pottery and stone bowls, as well as baskets used to place food items, sieves and mortar, as well as tables, in addition to auxiliary tools such as spoons and knives needed for cutting meat and hanging hooks, and many different pottery and stone utensils appeared. Many utensils were found dating back to about 400 BC, where well-polished red pottery was found in the shape of wide bowls, as well as long and thin utensils, and others with a round body. The pharaohs designed the spoons in the shape of a fish and a farmer. The pharaohs were creative in designing all the tools related to their daily life, including various tableware, most notably spoons, to confirm the statement of the historian Herodotus, who visited Egypt in the 5th century BC, that the Egyptians were the cleanest people in the world. Spoons were made of ivory and flint, then the materials for their manufacture developed and became made of copper, bronze and gold, and they took many forms that had connotations and meanings. Attractive and innovative shapes and designs implemented by the pharaohs in the form of a farmer carrying food, in reference to the great effort he made in feeding the ancient Egyptian and not wasting it, and another spoon in the shape of a fish, an animal, and also a girl, and many of these shapes and symbols on which the spoons were made bear meanings related to agriculture, and evidence of the importance of the crop that Egyptians eat in their lives. Spoons were not only for eating, but were used in ancient Egyptian civilization for other purposes, such as measures of medicine and other things. The ancient Egyptian civilization was not a civilization that built pyramids. Rather, they excelled in many, many specializations, the most prominent of which is medicine. Medicine was very advanced at that time, and included simple surgeries, repairing bone fractures, and installing many medications, despite the association of ancient Egyptian medicine in modern culture with magic and spells. However, medical research has shown its effectiveness in many cases, and the agreement of ancient Egyptian pharmaceutical formulations was 37% with known formulas according to the British Pharmaceutical Codex issued in 1973, as ancient Egyptian medical texts specified specific steps for examination, diagnosis, and treatment that were often logical and appropriate, according to the new website. Scientist. The Ibris Papyrus says. Medicine in the pharaonic era was different from our current era, as the tools they used were very advanced at that time. They were later discovered in many papyri, most notably the Ibris papyrus, which is considered one of the first Egyptian medical papyri written in human history. It is concerned with knowledge of herbs and dates back to 1550 BC. The pharaohs attributed the causes of disease. For two reasons, the disease is divided into two parts, human origin and non-human origin. The human origin results from an invisible pathogen such as the demon of disease, and the non-human origin results from the machine that punishes humans. The demon of illness. Doctors treated internal cases of disease, because it was difficult to see organ changes, they later created some terms for diseases. But as for the sick, they believed that the disease was due to an external cause, as the so-called demon of disease was widespread during this period 
and it suggested mystery and the demon of disease was considered to be responsible for any external disease. The patient's suffering, the demon of disease has infected many organs, so the patient was suffering. The theory spread that demons from the outside world pass through the body through openings, so securing the natural and accidental openings was the first step in treatment. 300 diseases were mentioned in ancient Egyptian texts that are difficult to identify, because medical prescriptions do not provide sufficient description, in addition to that most of what is mentioned are nothing but signs such as cough, fever, and obstruction. And, Malaria is considered one of the most dangerous epidemics that occurred among the pharaohs, which killed 70% of the population of Tel El Amarna. This is not the plague, which before our era was called the ancient Asian disease, and it was an example of some of the known diseases spread in ancient times, spinal pain, elephantiasis, schistosomiasis, polio, and intestinal worms, and each disease has a specific natural recipe. The ancient Egyptians diagnosed cases and then developed a specific method for diagnosing, giving treatment, and recording medical matters on the papyrus, which are 1. Interrogating the doctor. 2. Examination of the face and body, body odor, urine and feces. 3. Examination of the body and diseased organs, which is currently known as functional testing. 4. Diagnosis and judgment. 5. Giving treatment. What was treatment in the era of the ancient Egyptians? They used two types of treatments. 1. Treatment therapy, it currently represents all types of psychiatry. 2. Drug treatment, this is the administration of medication. It was considered the most popular method at the time, and most of the time the doctor would prepare the medication himself. Most medical texts describe a treatment that contains several types at the same time, such as beer, then milk, or honey, then oil, and meat. There were medical rules, for example, an adult patient took medications other than a child. An adult takes his medicine by swallowing, or a child takes his medicine by rubbing the medicine in the milk. Because of the importance of health to the ancient Egyptians, health was very important. Therefore, there were people who had the full right to diagnose and give treatment, such as pharmacists and nurses, and they received wages or gifts, and this was known as barter. They also had a specialty in medicine. An idea known from the days of the pharaohs, where every disease had a specific doctor, from dental specialization to internal medicine. Therefore, there were degrees in medicine. 1. The treating physician, he is responsible for the patient and diagnoses the patient's condition and follows up on treatment. 2. Physician supervisor, what is called the hospital director these days. 3. Chief physician, the highest medical rank at this time and he is called, in our current era, the Minister of Health. 4. Inspector of Physicians, he follows up on all the work of the health system, and this indicates the genius of the pharaohs in organizing in the field of medicine, as well as surgery and anatomy. The ancient Egyptians used surgery in cases of severe swelling and severe trauma, because this happens in a continuous manner, and this is due to, to the stones that fell on them when they built the pyramids and temples. This was proven in a papyrus that the merchant Edwin Smith bought in 1862 AD and was called the Smith Papyrus. Pharmacology. Pharmacology is an essential part of doctor's studies, as most of the formulations were made from natural ingredients in raw conditions. Nearly 4,500 years ago, the Egyptian surgeon was performing amputations on injured legs and hands without any problem, which confirms his knowledge of ways to stop bleeding and treat veins and arteries. It also revealed the skeletons of workers who had suffered fractures and were treated with amazing skill. The workers lived and continued their work without any problem. It was an unexpected surprise for me to discover the presence of a medical team residing at the construction site of the Giza pyramids whose mission is to preserve the health and safety of workers and artists. Can we imagine what would happen if an epidemic appeared and spread among 10,000 workers and their families residing in one place and working in large teams? Of course, without the existence of integrated healthcare, none of the giant pharaonic projects would have been completed. There were basic formulations in the therapeutic formulations, such as 1. Very small amounts of minerals. 2. Various molecules of more than 200 plants. 3. Animal parts such as meat, dairy, and fats. 4. Products of the human body, such as sweat and blood.
There are also important devices that help the doctor in preserving, as well as childbirth operations, health care for the mother and fetus after and before birth, and many other specialties. General wear and tear of the teeth was typical for almost all inhabitants of the land of the pharaohs. There are several reasons, but the main reason is the poor quality of food and the lack of vitamins and minerals. It is not a disease in itself, but the basis for the rapid appearance of other, more serious problems such as abscesses, inflammation of the gums and jaw bones, and loss of teeth. Although refined sugar had not yet been invented at that time, cavities and cavities already existed. Ancient doctors were familiar with almost all modern dental diseases. In their papyrus records, ancient dentists describe a number of conditions they had to deal with, dental abscesses, gum problems, loose teeth, ulcerative stomatitis, periodontitis, tooth decay, and tartar. The medics of ancient Egypt were aware that mistreatment of dental disease leads to serious problems and even death and the Egyptian dentist applied very practical drug treatments to relieve pain and prevent inflammation. The Ebers papyrus describes 11 methods of treating teeth, for example, relating to the problem of loose teeth. Such teeth are treated in two ways, either packed or filled with a mixture similar to what today we call composite a filling material, made from barley, mixed with honey and some disinfectants. This mixture was used to fill or fix dental problems. Furthermore, the pharaohs drank different types of juices, mixtures, and mouthwash to maintain oral hygiene, relieve pain, and stop inflammation. There were also some items made to chew or gargle and part of the ingredients in there were herbs like chili pepper, celery, etc. In addition to herbal treatment, dentists performed many complex operations and real surgery, jaw placement, surgical removal of abscesses and partial removal of damaged pieces of gum. Scientists found three cases of dental bridges being used at that time, where one or more missing teeth were connected with gold or silver wire to the surrounding healthy teeth. To maintain their teeth, use the toothbrush, one of the most important tools you use to care and clean your teeth. They were the first to invent it and had ways to care for oral and dental health. According to the brush website, the tools used in cleaning teeth go back to about 3500 to 300 BC when the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians used twigs. Trees used to clean food scraps with their teeth. Researchers found many ancient Egyptian tombs that contain toothpicks that were apparently used to clean the teeth from food scraps. Scientists discovered that many of the tree branches used to clean teeth were made from aromatic tree branches that make the breath smell good and at the same time work to remove plaque and food particles. They were also the first to create the first toothpaste in about 1500 BC by combining a mixture of bull hooves, pumice stone, and eggshells. The purpose of these toothpastes was to keep the gums and teeth clean while maintaining proper oral health. History Calv also reported that the pharaohs treated dental diseases using various tools such as bone saws, hard scales, chisels and other variety of dental tools. Among the diseases that were widespread among the ancient Egyptians at that time were tooth decay, receding gums, and bleeding. According to historical findings, pharaonic Egypt is considered the first to begin dentistry. They also invented the calendar. The ancient Egyptians had a common method for treating teeth, especially molars, as they used strings to unite misaligned teeth, so they were the first to invent braces. The oldest dentist known to us is Hesiare, praised by the god Ra, who lived in the 27th century BC. He was the minister of King Djoser, the builder of the first pyramid in Egypt. Step Pyramid at Saqqara Beauty was a very important element in the life of the ancient Egyptian, so women in the past deliberately applied those powders that are widely used in the current era. The American Network reported that men and women from all social classes, since the first era of the Egyptian pharaonic civilization, were using coal as eye adornment, as well as eye shadows and lipstick. There were rituals among pharaonic Egyptian women, especially princesses and women of the wealthy classes, specifically during the Middle Kingdom era in the period between 2030 to 1650 BC. 
Before the use of cosmetics, women followed a typical system. Women first prepared their skin before applying any of their makeup tools. The pharaonic woman was considered the first to use moisturizing masks for the skin, such as milk mixed with honey, which was also popular as a folk remedy. She also knew how to exfoliate the skin and use dead sea salts or milk in it. She also used plant oils to soften the skin and incense grains under the armpits as a deodorant. Also, the women of the pharaohs were the first to invent natural methods for removing excess hair on the body by mixing honey and sugar and making them into a semi-cohesive paste, the traditional method. The tools in which perfumes, eyeshadow, and oils were preserved were made of valuable materials, such as glass, gold, or semi-precious stones, in addition to the sandstone slabs used to grind the materials for eyeliner and eyeshadow were carved to resemble animals or gods, while the tool in which they were placed this material is in the shape of a woman. The pharaohs made eyeshadow by mixing malachite powder with animal fats or vegetable oils. When applying it, the woman would sit in front of her polished bronze mirror, and the servant would use a long stick of ivory carved with an image of the god Hathor and place it on the woman, just as women do now. Exactly, followed by a thick line of black eyeliner around her eyes. Eyeshadow had other purposes than cosmetics, as both men and women used it to protect the eyes from the glare of the sun in the desert. As for the materials used in making eyeliner, such as lead, they were manufactured so that when they were applied and met with eye moisture, they formed antibacterial substances. As for lipstick, it was usually made from materials mixed with animal fats or vegetable oils. However, the pharaonic queen Cleopatra was known to grind beetles to obtain the perfect lipstick. The appearance of mummies is an embodiment of the pharaonic identity, as the tombs that were discovered dating back to the ancient civilization indicated that it was common for the ancient Egyptians to place ivory combs, scented creams, jewelry, and cosmetics in the graves of women, men, and children, as cosmetic tools were discovered inside some of the tombs. The ancient Egyptians were closely linked to their general appearance, and this appeared in their art of mummification. For example, wooden coffins and anthropomorphic masks were depicted with women and young men of perfect beauty and smooth skin, and their eyes were defined with coal to give an elegant appearance. Indeed, the mummification process itself followed daily grooming rituals. There are many reasons why the ancient Egyptians needed to learn mathematics. One of them was related to agriculture and the seasons, because Egyptian farmers relied on the regular flooding of the Nile. It was important to know when the floods would come so that farmers could prepare for this reason. The ancient Egyptians taught themselves astronomy, and the priests used the Egyptians used these calculations to create the Egyptian calendar. Among the other reasons that made the study of mathematics important for Egypt and ancient civilizations in general, is to build a society, because the ancient Egyptian government needed to keep track of taxes and trade and relied on a class of professional scribes. These scribes learned to read and write and they also had to learn mathematics. It was discovered the Rhine document dates back to approximately 1650 BC. It was found and purchased by Alexander Henry Rhind in 1858, and the document is currently located in the British Museum. When the document was examined by scholars for the first time, it turned out to be a mathematical document written by a writer named Amos, and the document reveals important information about how the ancient Egyptians dealt with issues of multiplication, division, and fractions. The report refers to the engineering miracle and the precise techniques used in building the pyramids. And lost technology in ancient Egypt. The book provides an analysis of the stones used in their construction and reveals the use of huge, high-precision tools and machines in ancient Egypt. Also, building the pyramids in this geometric shape is the greatest evidence of the progress of the pharaohs in engineering. The pharaohs considered theft of tombs and violating the sanctity of the dead among the most heinous crimes that were punishable by death, as they were considered a violation of the sanctity of the god because the deceased became a minister, and the types of crimes punished by pharaonic law are not disclosing a plot against the pharaoh, disobeying the king's orders, killing sacred animals, and defect in sacred things, rape, magic, declaring lies about financial resources, not providing relief. To someone who was attacked by miscreants on the street, breaking an oath, 
killing his father. Also, thefts of tombs became widespread because they were of the utmost splendor and luxury, and were filled with royal wealth. Therefore, some of these cases were investigated by the pharaoh. In person, the minister used to sit at the top of the judicial system after the king in attending judicial sessions for various criminal cases, and in the papyrus preserved in the British Museum, BM10052, we find that the accused were brought before Minister Nob Nefert. Tomb thefts began to appear at their peak during the era of Ramesses IX, and among the jobs that appeared we find that there were employees who investigated the thefts of royal tombs and who served as deputies for investigations. There was also a job similar to that of the bailiff who delivered messages. They have the authority to confiscate or seize property. Execution with torture was a punishment for adultery, if it occurred among women of the first class in society. Then the punishment became stumping of the nose, and the killer, his father, was executed by inserting pieces of cane into his body, then the executioners cut small pieces of his flesh with a special machine, and after that he was thrown on the grave. A pile of straw was burned slowly, while execution by crucifixion was carried out on traitors and rebels. The judge has the authority to choose the method of executing criminals, including hanging, drowning, dismemberment, or burning. Some opinions hold that the convict was given incense or a narcotic drink to relieve his pain. The historian Diodorus of Sicily says that the execution was abolished or suspended during some periods of the rule of the 25th dynasty, and was replaced with a prison sentence with the criminal being chained and employed in public works. But it seems that the execution was soon repeated again and remained scheduled until the end of the pharaonic era, and even until now the death penalty exists in Egyptian law. The Egyptian army is the first regular army in the world dating back 5,200 years, after King Menes unified Egypt with its northern and southern regions in 3200 BC. Egypt had a unified army under the command of the King of Egypt, and it became the strongest army in the ancient world. Thanks to him, Egypt established the first empire in the world in the era of the New Kingdom, extending from Turkey in the north to Somalia in the south, and from Iraq in the east to Libya in the west. The army during Egyptian historical times. In the era of the Old Kingdom, 2686 to 2181 BC, starting with the era of building the pyramids, the Egyptians were compulsory conscripts to build and construct buildings seasonally during flood days, and the rich used to pay allowance to exempt them. The armament of soldiers in the Old Kingdom was primitive, consisting of clubs and sticks with a chamber attached to the top, and daggers and spears of copper. At the beginning of the Middle Kingdom 2055 to 1985, the governors of the regions enjoyed a kind of independence, so each region had forces similar to the army in preparation, organization, and weapons, in addition to special teams to protect the king himself, and these teams were assigned other tasks, including protecting trade missions, but King Sinusrit succeeded. The third was to eliminate the influence of the regional rulers, and began to form the first fixed, regular national army. As for the era of the New Kingdom, the Egyptian combat doctrine changed from defense to attack and conquest, in order to create strategic depth for Egypt in neighboring countries, and to secure Egypt's borders by attacking countries aspiring to occupy it, so Egypt had a professional, trained, and advanced regular army, which made it establish the first empire in the world. To achieve political and military control for Egypt over the neighboring countries, not with the aim of colonialism, but rather to spread Egyptian peace in these areas, and to secure the Egyptian borders from any new wave of invasion that might come to the region. The borders of the Egyptian empire reached their greatest extent during the reign of the great warrior pharaoh Thutmose III, and political influence extended. The Egyptian military forces range from the outskirts of the Euphrates River in the north in Syria to the Fourth Cataract in Nubia in the south. During the era of the New Kingdom, Egypt faced the threat of the Sea Peoples during the reign of King Ramesses III, as the migrations and invasions of the Sea Peoples in the regions of Syria, Palestine, Anatolia, and North Africa during the Late Bronze Age were like a devastating flood that destroyed the green and dry land and brought down cities, kingdoms, and empires in its path without mercy. And had Egypt and its army not confronted them, the civilization of the ancient Near East would have been lost forever, and the law of the jungle and backwardness would have dominated it for centuries. 
The Egyptians' military and historical struggle also emerged in the liberation war against the Hyksos under the leadership of the two great kings, Seknanre Tautu and Kames. The Egyptians were able under the leadership of Kamos, he liberated central Egypt from the influence of the Hyksos. Some historians believe that he brought the Egyptian forces to the walls of their capital, Avaris, in the eastern delta. Amos I continued the holy liberation march after the death of his brother Kamos. King Amos I began to pursue the Hyksos as far as Lebanon, which meant evacuating them from the areas in which they lived or took refuge. He not only purified Egypt of them, but also purified Palestine and Syria so that he would be safe from their treachery and their return to aggression. King Amos I sought after his military victories. In Asia, the way was open for the Egyptian land and naval military forces to establish the first Egyptian military base in the country of Jahi, to serve as an advanced defense point if the Hyksos thought about reorganizing themselves and tried to invade or simply raid the Egyptian borders again. Throughout Egyptian history, the ancient combat doctrine of the Egyptian army remained based on preserving its ethics during wars in preserving the lives of civilians and not attacking the property of other peoples during wars, as recorded for us by the walls of the tomb of King Pepi I 2323 to 2283 BC, in the era of the Sixth Dynasty, the campaign the military over Palestine was led by the military commander Wani who boasted that, none of them quarreled with others, none of them stole bread dough from a wanderer, none of them took bread from any city, and none of them begged from anyone. The Egyptian army consisted of organized, trained combat teams. The military discipline in the field was strict, based on obedience to the military orders of the division commander. The army consisted of two sections, infantry, and carriage riders. The latter section was more distinguished than the first section, and its officers were given the rank of royal clerks. The vehicles carried out the massive attack or with the help of the infantry in small groups consisting of 200 men under the command of the standard bearer. The division was divided into four sections with 50 men in each section. Their flags were images fixed to the ends of wooden stocks, and the guard divisions were divided into rows of each. There were 10 men in them and they marched in regular columns. In the era of great conquests, the king personally led military operations, and sometimes he participated in the war council or assigned the supreme command of the army to a great commander. There were military regions supervised by responsible officers. As for the ranks of the Egyptian army, in the past, the king was the supreme commander of the army, while the generals led on his behalf, and they were the ones who bore the title of prince of the army. Among the titles of army commanders there was the title of commander of the army, commander of the clash, and commander of the new soldiers. The king also assigned a crown prince. Covenant on his behalf sometimes. The minister assumed the task of the minister of war, and there was the position of army clerk during the time of war, and he was the one who carried out recruitment and supply work, and kept records of war battles. Their number was large and of different ranks, and the group of clerks was headed by the chief army clerk and royal clerk, in addition to the title keeper of the king's secrets, and the holder of this title is familiar with the goings-on in the palace and the army. The words of military commander Wani and his pride in his army members, none of them quarreled with others, none of them stole bread dough from a wanderer, none of them took bread from any city, and none of them begged from anyone, are considered the oldest historical document on the ethics and doctrine of the Egyptian army. In respect for civilians. The ancient Egyptians were the first to know the police system and used river ships to protect commercial convoys and ensure their safety. They also invented weapons and swords that were used to arm security men. The ancient Egyptians took care of the system of protecting paths, streets, roads, and cemeteries. The oldest police force in history was Egyptian, and the selection of the police chief depended on intelligence, broad-mindedness, and good morals from among the officers who held the rank of flag-bearer in the king's guard. There was a police chief for the capital and major cities due to the presence of workers carving and decorating tombs. The police for the city of southern Egypt had an important position because it was located on the route of bringing gold from Wadi Hammamet. There was great authority and influence for the chief of the desert police, which tracked those fleeing to the oases and protected the stone-cutting workers. He was the chief of the desert police. Under the direct supervision of the minister, 
the police flag had a picture of a deer in Thebes or a rectangular shield depicting the king striking an enemy. The police's relationship with the people was based on friendship, as stated in the advice of the wise man Ani to his son, which was, take the policeman on your street as your friend and do not let him revolt against you. The police services consisted of the local police to maintain order in major cities such as Memphis, Thebes, Tel El Amarna and the Desert, and the Royal Guard, which was supervised by the minister. It also included the temple police, which was dedicated to maintaining order inside them, the cemetery police to preserve and protect the treasures they contained, and the state security police to uncover conspiracies and monitor the actions of rulers. In the regions, there was what was called the River Police to provide security for trade across the Nile River. In the era of Amenhotep III, piracy spread in the Mediterranean basin, so the king appointed a guard for the Egyptian coasts and the mines and quarries police, and the police were assigned other tasks such as assisting in collecting taxes, monitoring the control of measures, weights, and bread, and preventing fraud. The police force was in the Ptolemaic era, beginning in 30 BC. The officers and leadership positions in it were Greeks, then the Egyptians gradually entered. The officers were armed with the sword, while the assistants were armed with the whip and the soldiers with the stick. Among the tasks assigned to the police in that period were also the protection of agricultural lands, border guards, special tasks, private guards, river police, and judgment enforcement police. The Romans followed in the footsteps of the Ptolemies at first, then they resorted to a dual system that included civilian policemen to maintain security and order, who were appointed from the people of the region and also included army men. The policemen in that period were volunteers. The police system in the Byzantine period, from 297 AD to 641 AD, consisted of the duke, who was the chief of police and head of the diocese, and played the role of police director. A force was established to maintain public order, arrest defendants in cities and villages, and hand them over to the judiciary, and special police to guard the major landlords. No people in the ancient world used colors as the ancient Egyptians did, and evidence of that is their tombs spread everywhere from the north to the south, in addition to the temples. The ancient Egyptian had a meaning and significance for every color. Rather, the colors were linked to religious symbolism. We were able to determine the nature of most of the colors used by the ancient Egyptian. We will find that the green color is called waj among the pharaohs, synonymous with fertility, growth, and the restoration of life again. This is in contrast to the red color, which was known as dasher, which meant strength and anger to them, and was associated with the famous legend of the destruction of mankind. As for the white color, it is known as hadage, and it indicates purity, serenity, and high social status. It is the color of white linen worn by the king, nobles, and senior officials. As for the black color, km, it indicated darkness. To soil fertility and regrowth. As for the color yellow, its name among the pharaohs was kanjet, which means immortality and permanence, and its greatest manifestation was represented by the golden rays of the sun. As for the color blue, it is one of the secrets of the pharaohs and it is not just an ordinary dye color. In addition to being a color that was difficult to manufacture at that time, Egyptian blue has multiple chemical properties that can help in several fields. Natural blue. The color blue was not common in paintings and murals in the times before the pharaohs. This is due to the scarcity of blue minerals and the fact that they are chemically unstable and difficult to form color from. Blue is found in nature in the precious lapis lazuli stone or the precious stone lazuli, which are rare stones from which color is difficult to form. Including. As for the paintings of the pharaohs and the murals of their temples and tombs, you find an interesting variety of forms of blue, which research has proven to be not from lapis lazuli or natural lapis lazarite, which sparked the curiosity of researchers to know more about the source of the blue color in the pharaonic era. According to an article published by the Royal Society of Chemistry on the Analysis of Archaeological Evidence, vessels dating back to about 3100 BC were found that were made from a deep blue dye, and after 2500 BC, three shades of blue were found, all of them from a compound of silicate and copper. The pharaohs were able to extract a pigment composed of copper, iron oxides, silica and calcium which is a mixture of sand believed to be from specific areas of the desert and crushed limestone, calcium carbonate, 
with fragments of bronze or copper that are heated and melted at temperatures ranging between 850 and 1000 degrees Celsius to form into end Egyptian blue. The first evidence of the use of Egyptian blue was observed in the 4th dynasty, 2575 to 2467 BC, where it appears on limestone sculptures from that period, and in the Middle Kingdom, 2050 to 1652 BC, and it continued to be used as a dye in tomb decoration. Wall paintings, tapestries and statues. Its most famous use was in the famous crown of Queen Nefertiti mixed with precious stones found in the temple of her husband Akhenaten. Although the powder was discovered in prehistoric times, its multiple chemical properties were not discovered until recently. Chemical Properties of Egyptian Blue Research in the last decade has revealed what distinguishes Egyptian blue from other dyes, as it is used today in solving crime mysteries and scientific research because of its unique chemical properties. Scientists also tested the uses of Egyptian blue as a photographic dye on animals and plants and the structure of tissues in the nucleus of the fruit fly cell. The research was led by Tina Salguero, assistant professor of chemistry at Georgia. Their findings on Egyptian blue were published on the website of the Royal Society of Chemistry and indicated the ability of copper and calcium silicates providing a new class of interesting nanomaterials with numerous applications such as infrared biomedical imaging and security ink formulations. The nanoreflective properties of this component can be used to detect fingerprints at crime scenes, especially on smooth surfaces that are difficult to the usual fingerprint detection powder, where they show light and reflect lines with extreme precision. The holy books are a collection of religious texts that express the Egyptians' perception of the life of the dead in the afterlife. It includes a set of spells that are recited when preparing the body for burial, and when feeding the deceased and offering him offerings, in addition to spells to protect him from all the evils expected in the other world. These texts are one, alarum texts. It is the oldest sacred religious book of the pharaohs, which was first recorded on the interior walls of the rooms and corridors of the pyramid of King Aunas in Saqqara, and then continued to be recorded inside the pyramids of the kings of the sixth dynasty and their wives in Saqqara. Starting in the Middle Kingdom, these texts moved, with some development, to the inner surfaces of the coffins, and became known as coffin texts. The French scientist Mas Piro discovered these texts, between the years 1810 to 1880, in the pyramids of Unas, Pepi I, Marianare, and Pepi II. The pyramid texts varied between dramatic and magical texts, chants and prayers, spells, texts, sacrificial rituals, and others. The Alarum texts, which primarily aim to protect the deceased from the evils he faces in the afterlife, shed light on the formation of the other world and how the deceased reached it, and the influence of the various beliefs that appeared on the scene of ancient Egyptian religion is clear, such as the Heliopolis doctrine, which it makes the god Are the center of this other world, which this doctrine considered in heaven. The number of its spells is approximately 800, and its recording was limited to the pyramids of the kings at the end of the 5th dynasty, and throughout the 6th dynasty. 2. Coffin Texts Texts engraved inside one of the coffins. The number of spells that make up this type of text reaches, 1200 spells, recorded throughout the eras of the First Transition and the Middle Kingdom on the surfaces of coffins inside and outside, on boxes for storing vessels of the viscera, on paintings and papyri. These texts were found in several sites in Egypt. The aim of the coffin texts was to ensure eternal life for the deceased. 3. The Book of the Dead it is one of the most important religious books that dominated religious thought in the period from the 18th to 21st dynasties. It consists of 200 chapters, as mentioned by the German scholar Lepsius. The chapters of the Book of the Dead were recorded on papyrus, the walls of the New Kingdom tombs, the 21st dynasty, coffins, shrines, mummy scrolls, and some amulets. These texts were recorded in simplified hieroglyphics and hieratratic script, and the texts were sometimes provided with scenes. The texts of the Book of the Dead were influenced by what was mentioned in the texts of the pyramids and sarcophagi, although they showed great interest in the texts of the trial of the deceased in the other world through the court of Osiris, especially chapter 125, which relates to the denial confession of the sins committed by the deceased. The Book of the Dead aims primarily at how to help the deceased emerge from his grave during the day. 4. The Book of Gates 
one of the books of the underworld, and almost a copy of the book What is in the Other World. It appeared in most of the tombs of the New Kingdom, along with the book What is in the Other World, and it also appeared in one cemetery for individuals. This book is distinguished from the book What is in the Other World in that it includes the court of Osiris. It stipulates, I did not wrong anyone. I did not treat the animal badly. I did not lose weight. I did not stop the floodwaters. I did not hesitate to make donations to the temples. I didn't steal. I did not kill, etc. Egyptian civilization is filled with many secrets and exciting events that have made it the focus of the whole world. It has a great history, and they have wonderful scientific secrets that have been discovered and which have not been discovered to this day. The pharaohs also had customs and traditions, some wonderful, some bad, and some very strange and also disgusting, and also one of them that continues to this day among the Egyptians, he continued with us. 1. Mummification of women, this was one of the bad customs, although women in the pharaonic civilization enjoyed equality with men in all rights, except that if a man died during the pharaohs were mummified in a decent way, but women were treated differently, especially if it was a beautiful lady. She was left for four or five days to be mummified before being sent to the embalmers. The main reason behind this was that people at that time did not trust the embalmers for fear that they would someone rapes the body of a beautiful woman, especially after one of the embalmers caught his colleague doing this criminal act and reported him. 2. The Wedding Ring This custom continues to this day, not only among the Egyptians, but also in the whole world, and its concept among the pharaohs was that it is one of the important things in marriage because it gives blessing, love, and continuity of companionship between spouses, and it was called the ring among the pharaohs. In the name of Both Circle. 3. They had a very strange custom, which was that a child should not wear any clothes until he reached adolescence. 4. The ancient Egyptians were known for their tremendous ability in herbal treatment, but there was something strange, which is that although the antibiotic was discovered thousands of years after the pharaohs, the pharaohs were treating the patient while eating moldy bread on which the penicillium fungus was growing, from which penicillin is extracted, which is one of the best antibiotics. 5. The pharaoh was not allowed to show his hair, so he always wore a crown or robe over his hair. 6. Even today, some Egyptians in the countryside and Upper Egypt hang the Eye of Horus on the doors of their homes in order to keep evil, enemies, and envy away from them. This act was inherited from the pharaohs, as the Eye of Horus symbolized the god Horus of the pharaohs, who was considered the god of goodness and peace. And protection. 7. Even today in all parts of Egypt, the Egyptians hold condolences for their dead after their death and also again after forty days have passed. This was one of the most important customs of the pharaohs regarding death and mummification, as there was a belief that this would make the soul liberate and go to the other world in hello. 8. The pharaohs had some democratic laws, including giving slaves the freedom to strike in order to obtain their rights. 9. They held some celebrations for the newborn seven days after his birth, believing that the newborn sense of hearing begins seven days after his birth. His birth. 10. The ancient Egyptians worshipped more than 1,400 pharaonic deities. Many ancient tombs contain toilets that accompanied the dead to the afterlife. 11. The builders of the pyramids received four liters of beer as a salary, as beer was the official currency. Beer was made from barley, and it was heated in vats, in which the grains were mixed with water. There is a factory for producing beer in the northern area of Abydos in Sohag Governorate. I found 40 vats, which produced 22,400 liters of beer per day. The 1. 12. The pharaohs used to sleep on pillows made of stones. 13. The oldest clothing in the world was discovered in Egypt and was made 5,000 years ago. 14. Killing cats, even by mistake, would have taken its owner to the death row as they created the first cemetery for pets. In the world, it is a nearly 2,000-year-old cemetery that includes cats wearing collars of iron and beads. The secret of the ancients' passion for cats is due to their ability to catch mice and snakes, 
and they were so beloved that the ancient Egyptians gave their children cat names such as Dead, which means cat for girls, according to University College London.15, the pharaohs had an interesting custom where they would permanently shave their hair and beards. In the event of the death of a pharaoh, his hair and beard were shaved off and placed in his coffin with him. 16. The pharaohs used honey as an anesthesia during surgical procedures. They also used essential oils and herbs for anesthesia. 17. The pharaohs believed that bread was sacred, and they believed that neglecting or wasting it meant insulting their god. 18. The pharaohs believed that a beard represented strength and authority, so they would permanently shave their hair and beards, and they would wear false beards to keep the face clean from scratch. Their point of view is that they wear some scarves and belts that symbolize strength. Pharaoh's crowns, or the headdress of a king or ruler during the era of the pharaohs, express their love of adornment. The ancient Egyptians found that the crown was one of the adornments that reflected their value as kings of ancient civilization. The crown has many different shapes and materials, often made of gold or silver, in the pharaonic and Roman era. It symbolizes power, authority, legitimacy, victory, victory, immortality, righteousness, resurrection, honor, and the glory of life after death. There is no doubt that it carries symbols of the faith of the king, the people of his country, his subjects, and his state. The crowns of the pharaohs also carry symbols such as the cobra, and the gods of the pharaohs wear certain and many crowns. The king's crown differs in shape and size from the queen's crown, and crowns have been made throughout history from various materials, often precious. 1. The White Crown The White Crown dates back to the pre-dynastic period, and it is said that it was the crown of a ruler in Lower Egypt and then it became a royal symbol for Upper Egypt. The ancient Egyptian name for the crown is Hadjet, meaning white, and it is similar to a cylinder made of leather that is elongated upwards and ends in a spherical shape. Above, one of the most important evidences of the antiquity of the white crown is the painting of King Narmer, founder of the First Dynasty, currently in the Egyptian Museum. 2. Red Crown The red crown coincided with the white crown, and its meaning in the ancient Egyptian language is dashret, meaning red. The reason for calling it red is due to its connection with the god Horus, who became the god of Lower Egypt during the rule of the Hyksos, as he was the main god that the Hyksos worshipped in that period due to the similarity between him and their god Hannibal. The choice of the red color is due to the color of blood and evil represented by the god Horus. This crown was also associated with other gods such as the goddess Wajet, and this explains its previous name as the green crown, as it is an embodiment of her, and also the god Ness, who was worshipped in Sais, and all of this before the worship of Set as his god. For Lower Egypt. 3. Double Crown. It appeared for the first time in the first dynasty after the completion of the unification process between the northern and southern kingdoms, which ended at the hands of King Menes or Narmer. The name of the crown comes from the merging of the white crown as a symbol of Upper Egypt and the red crown as a symbol of Lower Egypt. In many of the times when the two kingdoms later separated as a result of periods of weakness or external invasion, a king would appear who would unify them, and when the unification process was completed, the king would be represented by wearing a double crown to indicate the rulings of controlling both Upper and Lower Egypt. This crown was not limited to the king only, but it was there are some gods who wear it, such as the god Horus, and the double crown symbolizes sanctity and legitimacy in rule. 4. Blue Crown it is made of leather and fastened to the head. It appeared in the second intermediate period during the reign of Camos, the brother of King Amos, during the fight against the Hyksos, and it was called Kabresh. 5. The Borrowed Chin. There is rarely a picture or statue, dating back to ancient Egyptian pharaonic times, without a beard or a long chin. In most cases, beards among the ancient Egyptians were evidence of their distinguished social status and distinguished the kings from the common people despite the fact that they were mostly naked and fake beards, and they were not the ancient Egyptians did not have any problem with the growth of the chin, although they chose a false chin as an alternative to growing their beards out of concern for their personal hygiene, as they considered a beard, mustache, and thick eyebrows as evidence of uncleanliness.